Alrighty, might as well get rolling. Hello there. Allow me to set up things as I want to do. If I sound a little sketchy, I think I always end up sounding kind of sketchy when I do these. I don't know why. Hi, chat window. Bing. There we go. So, greetings. We're going to do my usual coding stream. Uh, some things don't have to get disrupted, yay. And uh, it's just one of them. I'll fire up my little audio. I've actually got uh, quite a lot in the pipeline as far as stuff I'm dealing with or working on or whatever. Uh, may or may not be of interest for me to tell you about. Um, one thing that's high on my uh, priority list at the moment is uh, I have become filled with the passion to pick up a uh, Chapman stick, which if I can do, I can make all manner of samples and things, but it might also help as far as thinking up music to do, seeing as the last music that I tried to do, I deleted and threw away because it was too unstructured. And there's a great deal that is going into trying to come up with some more structured stuff. So yeah, that's the thing. I'm thinking that uh, today I can look into doing something about that. I've also released the uh, other reverb. Or one of the other reverbs, there are three. But I released a uh, matrix verb And that seems to have gone over pretty well. And uh, the one that I call just refurb is the simplified version, which I feel is more approachable. Enthusiastic about that. That's the one I'm personally going to be using. I do not have a lot of patience for needing to adjust five different controls just to dial in a particular sound when I'm going to be trying to dial in to what I consider realism anyway. So the new version of Reverb is very much what I have in mind. I maintain the uh, release of stuff like Matrix Verb with all the controls because I know that people also enjoy controls. And it's this funny thing, it's a combination... Here, let me... I remember now what I was going to do. I was going to refocus. Hold on while I whip this out. Camera. OBS. And a little... Zooming in. Hey, Sanctus. It is nice to catch you up. And let's tell camera to... Autofocus and see whether it can. Okay, I'm going to call that good. One thing that you will experience yourself if you wind up building a internaut's presence and stuff like I do is that if you don't have a team you do everything. So I pause these live streams to focus or deal with stuff 
and I got to move this or cover it because I'm staring at my own face on the screen because it's moving. There we go. That should work better. So, uh, yeah. I can also tell you about something else, although my focusing just screwed that up, but I think I can still manage. I did something. You might have seen this in the plugin video. This is my old Ibanez. And it happens to be a Ibanez where um, I can get around on this pretty briskly. And uh, the thing about that is I haven't always played this one because it hasn't had the sounds and pickups and stuff. So what I did with this, and uh, let me know if, the, I think this should be showing on the screen properly. I'm trying to do it even though I zoomed in on my face. Um, this contains a new thing that I didn't have before. It's a version of the Gibson Veritone circuit. I found it, uh, you know, on, on Reverb, the, uh, with the website. A company is making these. And what this is, is this switched circuit where one is bypass, and then it cuts in increasingly large capacitors that are um, in series with a inductor. So what the Gibson Veritone circuit is, and I've got it set up so that each of the pickups has a volume control. I do have a working switch. It's actually some kind of old Gibson switch, I think. Either that or it's, no, it's not a Gibson switch. It's the one that came with the, the Fender uh, Mustang with two pickups, stole that. And then I have a slightly wonky, but basically functional um, ordinary tone control, just sort of on the output jack. So what this does is this patches in the um, Veritone circuit. And having shown this to you, I can just tell you at this stage, so I will put it back up on its little rack. Um, here's why this matters as far as me happily and successfully making some more structured music so that people are less annoyed by my demos. The reason that's exciting to me is because the very tone circuit is used extensively in one of my favorite albums, namely, uh, Yes is Close to the Edge. And I have confirmed this by patching it up and running it into a little battery amp that I could distort and getting some pretty convincing sounds off of, you know, the type of guitar sound that you get off of, say, a Siberian Katru that beginning guitar sound with such a striking characteristic noise. That's very tone circuit. That is a massive notch filter sucking out all the lower mids. It's like position uh, five or six, I think. And it's going into some distortion. And it's a, dis it's a distorted Fender twin. So it's a really abrasive sound. And that's that would have been loud in the studio, which is part of how you get amazing guitar sounds. So I've now got a new primary guitar. All the other ones, including the real but undesirable model and cheap, uh, and by cheap I mean the thing with three hundred and fifty bucks, uh, Les Paul, are now kind of deprecated because I have a new thing in town. I'm going to take a moment and look at the Les Paul, though, because did I? Yes, I did. The Les Paul does have a little switch, which is a green ringer circuit. It's the same thing that Zappa used in his guitar, 
if I'm not mistaken. And uh, if that switch is on, it will go dead and I'll have to replace the battery and that's no fun. But um, the thing about replacing that with the Ibanez, and the nice thing about something like that is I got the Ibanez for way cheaper than you would get a real Gibson ES-175. Hey, awesome. I'm pleased, Sanctus, that uh, you're enjoying the way that the reverb works. Thing about being able to go with the uh, the new guitar with that kind of stuff is I can engage that uh, notch filter circuit and get a lot of tones that really lend themselves to the type of playing that I do on that instrument. And I can combine it with uh, the rec and make stuff up. And the remainder of that is that I moved the synthesizer stuff over to be run off of a little tracker thing. It's a thing called a NerdSeq. And all morning I was working on that as well. I have the chord organ set up. They were set up with this complicated way of being able to kind of improvise um, stuff procedurally. With the NerdSeq, that's all out the window. I'm just telling it what to do. So it doesn't actually need the cycle of fifths, but it does need the ability maybe to come up with unusual chords. So I'm leaving that in place, meaning that I've had to paste little notes on all the keys of my little uh, Arturia key step, which is plugged into the NerdSeq so that I can activate chords and program the thing that way rather than just having to do it picking note by note. All, all this basically means um, it's all about, and I feel that this is characteristic for a lot of things. Um, the setting stuff up always takes a lot more time than uh, playing on it. So I find it's very much a thing, and I certainly, I suffer this greatly. It takes endless years to set things up to get to the point where I can sit down and bang out a track in 45 minutes. And if I get to a position where I can do that easily and freely, I can do lots of those, and that becomes great. But it takes years to set all of the things in place. Like, Assuming that I do tracks with actual vocals. Well, I've set up the, I got a microphone that's suitable for that. I set it up with the little sort of vocal booth damper things so that I can suppress some of the reverberation a little bit. And I know ways of doing that. That's been weeks of work. The whole synthesizer stuff has been literally years of getting together. And it was a couple of hours even setting it up with the keyboard to actuate the chords properly. I've spent more hours learning how to use it. If people are interested in NerdSeq, or indeed sequence uh, trackers in general, then I'm more than happy to go into that. Perhaps not today, but I think it'll end up happening. And uh, regarding stuff with lyrics. I have been talking about that uh, cheap ass rhymes thing for how many months now? Probably about a year now. Finally finished it. And by finished, I mean there's still some adjustments that could be made. Some of the words are, I think, in the wrong places. That's fine. It can be, it can be fiddled with as I run into stuff like that. So that's another couple of years. And that's still assuming that um, if I do something like that, I can come up with things to vocalize in a song that would make some kind of sense or work. And uh, here, let me fuss with my controls. There we go. Uh, hmm. Have I just, no, I didn't just cut out the volume entirely. I got a delicate controller. And 
this is pretty much my experience. And one of the things I could do is start streaming all of this preparation stuff. It would give you more of an idea of what's actually involved with producing things, producing anything. Because there's always a giant pile, you know, it's like Ben Franklin going like genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. There's a fair amount of that. Um, why do I not use, use Cubase? Because I don't know it. Also, I discovered recently that, what's the name of it? I ended up not liking it again. Um, one of the reasons was because it nagged me and I'd have a really hard time with the GPL program nagging me incessantly. I should be gentle about that though, because I might end up being friendly with the developer. The Ardor. Ardor has post fader in inserts. So if anybody is interested in digging into that kind of stuff, it's a natural match for for use of uh, console and stuff. But yeah, there's just a lot of work behind everything and you got to embrace it. You got to kind of roll with that kind of stuff and can't get too caught up into sitting down and needing to have outcomes every time you sit down. Joku, we disagree on the reverb. I liked it. If you think it sucks balls because it has no controls, that's what matrix verb is for. It has the same sounds as matrix verb. If you think matrix verb sucks balls, then I don't know what to tell you. You're going to be one sad puppy because if I come up with more reverbs, they'll probably go even farther in that direction. So, oh well, you're going to have to look to somebody else for your reverbs. So, I don't know to what extent people, well, pocket, verb, pocket verbs isn't that good, but it is, it has a bunch of really weird colors. I guess maybe you really love the weird colors. That's cool. Nothing wrong with that. Pocket verbs is a pain in the butt to compile. I'll tell you that. It takes three times to 10 times as long as anything else to compile because it's way too big of a pile of code and it's very poorly organized and it's just like 27 all pass or comb filters all arranged in different ways but that said maybe it's you just like all pass filters better than combs because that's one of the things about pocket verbs is it's a, a lot of variations on the all pass filter Similar to NV, you might also like NV, maybe you just like all passes. I won't stop doing all passes, so I shouldn't, don't, don't take that as I'll never do something you like again. Just that that might not be your, your, my primary motivation. Yeah, I was talking about some of the uh, guitar bass things. The... I'll give you this, pocket verb, uh, no, matrix verb and reverb step farther away from all passes than anything in pocket verbs or MV, because MV is all, all passes. All passes are smear effects. Comb filters are echo effects. Generally, you need both. There are all passes in both matrix verb and in uh, reverb, but I didn't play them up all that much. There's just two wall passes for each channel and, or e each, two different all passes feed each matrix. And there's two of them for every channel. And face not just an all pass filter, I think it's a People define these in all kinds of funny ways. There's always the chance that I'm missing something or that I don't know a detail about how things are defined. In which case, oops, and oh well. But uh, I was talking about one of the things I was excited about and I hope to see this unfolding as well. Um, I'm very pumped up about the idea of picking up a Chapman stick. And 
this also comes over the course of years, but not really, it kind of resolved itself because one of the things I've had on my list of stuff that I wanted to like include with, you know, like say, electric piano. I'm not getting rid of that anytime soon and I like having that around and I think it's going to come into play when I'm recording music that can be used for demos and stuff more actively getting into and I mean you should like me getting more into this because rather than spending little literally years on end learning how to work actual modular synthesizers and run them into an analog mixing desk if I'm tracking songs like I just barely started to do and then it wasn't structured enough and went over really poorly. And that one time that I did the heavy metalish thing that I've been using ever since, when I do that, I'm working in a DAW. What I've done with console seven beats my analog mixer. And it's not a cheap analog mixer, but what I'm doing in console seven beats the analog mixer. So on the grounds of that, me diving more into this like proggy coming up with like here's another example i'll grab this this stuff that i've been doing as far as trying to come up with a sort of card game for how to make a musical structure and basically gamify the writing of typically a progressive rock song because that's what I care about. You could do pop this way too if you wanted. Um, that's a process of being able to sit down and come up with something not unlike the way that uh, Brian Eno's Oblique Strategies cards works. With his it's very much like Zen Koans. It's very much like oh you're stuck being creative? Well you know, step to the left. And you're supposed to take that as inspiration for how you're going to resolve the thing that you're working on. Well, what I have in mind for this is gamifying it, like deal yourself seven cards or deal yourself 11 cards or whatever, and then play five of them or three of them or whatever, and combine them in such a way that they get what you'd call a high score based on numbers of these transitions for types of sound that are being a striking contrast, or as you see with this silver one here, how long can you keep a consistent feel going by alternating with these various colors with some limited rules as far as, like it may or may not be possible to have lots of multiple copies of things. It may or may not be possible to say, put two of the same one together and then you have a particular quality going across four different sections or putting them together in this way so you have the quality going across uh, again four or three different sections and that would be the same as having one of these so I'm thinking maybe not to do that but it's like that getting into all of these things and I have every intention of when I get this resolved and it's been many hours of getting all this together printing up decks of cards which are not likely to be cheaper at cost. That's likely to be a profit center where I can get more stuff that I can give away to people who need it. And I'll work it that way. But it's also not likely to be um, funding drive level insanely overpriced stuff specifically for the purpose of like only people who throw lots of money towards these other goals get to do that. I've got also these, like this is a fairly large deck based off of that circle of fifths chart that I've made, which I have posted. That's on the Air Windows site. So you could make one of these by buying a couple of decks of cards and filling it out the way that I described. And I'm labeling it up so it says things like uh, this one centered on F minor but it also has a six written on it, which means that it is in line with, I believe I was calling that the Dorian mode. And so if you play a bunch of these and they line up in a certain way, you can make the 
chain of chords that you follow through the thing. And if you start on the F minor and make a cycle based on that, you'll be an F Dorian. And that will also help as far as composing or thinking up ways to like play solos and stuff over it. And I'll mention again that I'm very excited about um, getting a Chapman stick because one of the keyboards I've been interested in is a clavi. I've been interested in a Horner clavinet for literally years now. It's the You can put one on top of a Rhodes. I'm not likely ever to do that because I've got a Moog sitting on top of the Rogue. It's a, a sub fatty. It's like one of the cheapest ones you can get, but I think it's one of the best. And I know how you can patch it into like Moog Mother 32s to get an extra oscillator and a bunch of extra behavior. The thing is, anything that you can do with a clavinet as a keyboard player, you can do with the Chapman stick as a guitarist or bass player you become a Chapman stick player instead. And it's a completely different motion, but it's literally the same thing. It's literally the same thing as playing a clavi. And it's, I don't know, reasonably comparable to getting a really nice uh, Horner clavinet. But there's more. The, the Rick that I've got, I got a special jack just to set it up so that you could, or that I could, um, run the neck and the bridge pickups, which the one that I've got, it didn't come with the neck pickup, but somebody put it in, like ruining the resale value of the instrument, but I don't care. And uh, I have one of those stereo cables where you plug into the Reco sound thing and then plug into two different amplifiers or a DI and a amplifier. Well, you know a thing about the, the Chapman stick, you might not know this if you've never looked into them. It's an instrument that was all over like late period King Crimson, all, all the late period King Crimson's. The, the song Elephant Talk is just all stick. It's, uh, it starts out with uh, sort of, mel it's all on the bass side of the stick, but that, that whole like, dun, 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 that's all, all stick, including the hammer on pull off stuff in the beginning. The stick has a um, stereo pickup. Sticks have two sides. They're centered around that bass string if you set them up in the usual way so that that middle note, the giant string, which is the bass note that you can do so many things on, focus on, is where the two sides are divided. And going up towards you is more bass notes. It's sort of, in, it's like, it's like a uh, lefty guitar being played by a righty. The bass notes are on the other side, and then you go up toward things. That other side going down, which is all finer strings, that's the melody side. That's a separate pickup. That's a separate output. And what you normally do is use a guitar amp or something like that. You can also get MIDI on these, on either side or both. It's, they're very expensive. To do, but they might be polyphonic MIDI, which would be an additional thing. And yeah, Tony Levin playing the stick in Liquid Tension. I was just watching that the other day. I was just watching a Liquid tem Tension experiment, Acid Rain, on uh, YouTube the other day because I was diving into this rabbit hole around wanting a stick. Well, the thing about it is they generally have to sell you a cable that will let you plug the stick in. Well... I already have a cable that would work. I already have the cable because now the the Rickenbacker with its Rico sound input and then the recent changes I did to the relatively cheap reissue of the Fender Mustang with its two pickups, I set that up the same way. I set that up so that I could have its bridge pickup going into a guitar amp and the neck pickup going into a DI. And I have my DI going into a compressor. It's what I use for the roads. That would work perfectly for the bass side of a stick. And it also lets me do things like the echo jam stuff that I do. Sort of like your, you know, Pink Floyd, The Wall, or one of these days. 
perfect for a stick. That would be the perfect thing to do for a stick. Because the slight percussiveness of playing a stringed instrument that you can still bend and stuff on sticks as if it was a clavi. Hey, Zubia. Um, as if it was a clavi is perfect for that kind of stuff. And you could do really staccato notes or you could do more sustained stuff, just all kinds of things. I have been playing uh, some of my guitars in the stick kind of way, been holding them in that funny way, which is really awkward for a, a real guitar. And you can't hand mute it that way. You really need to have the real stick or have it be damped in some kind of way to make it work. I've been playing that just to see whether I could do the adaptation, and I'm pretty sure that I can. Maybe I'll end up being the studio musician for some of you guys. I'll have a special thing where it's like, hey, if you're my Patreon thing, I'll jam with you or play on one of your tracks for free or something. We'll see. Depends. It depends upon whether it's fun, and it depends upon whether it's something that I have time for, but we'll see. And here's the thing. With the guitar setup that I came up with for playing along with my synthesizer explorations, with the bass setup that I came up with for getting a successful progressive rock tone and all that stuff that I'm doing, I could plug the stick in and do bass parts on that, do bass parts with echo jam or throw some flanging on any number of things along those lines lead parts on the melody side or patch the melody side into the guitar synthesizer stuff that I've already got and be playing stick while also playing on the Roland Alpha Juno 2 through the uh, the Sonus GT. Anybody who's watched my, my um, synthesizer jams knows that I've spent a lot of time getting like grooves and things happening because I've put so much effort into making this sort of self-evolving. I think it fools people because you don't necessarily know that it's generative if um, it's making too much sense. So I have all this generative stuff going on that just kind of, I don't think people notice that it's generative because it's not doing dumb stuff. It's doing fairly approachable stuff. It's just that if it changes keys successfully a couple of times to go to a completely different place and I go along with it, it's like, oh yeah, nothing happened. <laughs> that's, that's far from the case. So if you've been familiar with any of that stuff that I've done, you also know that I spent a lot of time playing guitar like the, that Les Paul or whatever into the guitar synthesizer and I'm playing the guitar, but it sounds like a synthesizer and I have a lead voice on that that I've become very fond of. And the stick would naturally lend itself to doing that. So the whole thing is very exciting. I'm going to see whether I can pursue that a little bit um, today, like put the wheels in motion as far as getting that together. That said, it is now 11.32, so I enjoy spending a half an hour letting you know the stuff that I'm working on and what has me interested, what has me excited, because it's like, oh, you're going to be on live stream talking about it? Cool. All right. I'm going to be doing something at that time, but that's cool. Um... Seeing as it is 11.30 and I got about an hour and a half before I got to go and do some other stuff, maybe it'd be a good idea to switch over to coding. So let's whoop, go to my little picture in picture and fire up, I think. I said we were going to look into preponderant. Some of the other stuff that we've done, for instance, me working on channel 9 is going to continue to develop, but I've got to do some dialing the sounds in. Channel 9 contains the code that I can use for having uh, ultrasonic filtering set up a little higher, so it still does its thing, but um, if you're at 44.1k, for instance, some of that stuff will shut itself off, and that seems useful. The whole 
repeated use of lots of biquad filters is being somewhat more CPU intensive, but computers these days can kind of handle it. As long as it still runs on the laptop that you see. Let me also take a moment to bring up OBS just so that I can confirm that. Yep. Okay, that's still working. Yeah, post information without the linking should be good. And reading up at the top of the live chat there, Sanctus, don't worry about it. I've spent a lot of time telling people it's okay if they're not on the Patreon. Um, I can afford to not have everybody chasing after that. In fact, if you need the money more than me, then then you should definitely not be on it. Or if you're in trouble or you need to drop off of the Patreon, you should do that and trust that I'll be okay. I promise that I will. I don't know how better, I mean, I can't think of how better to exemplify that than like getting a stick or something and starting to use that. I think that more or less proves that I don't desperately need your money. So it's like, yeah, I'm fine at this time. And don't worry about it. I am going to continue to progress until the Patreon kind of goes directly towards giving people useful stuff. I'm still working on, uh, like now I have all of my rules of wire right next to me. You can't see it and I haven't got all the, the um, camera set up for it. At some point I think I'll probably just start. I'll probably just be like, okay, let's have the little console of um, video things set up and then I'll be able to bop around a little bit more. Right now that's not convenient, but uh, you can take my word for it that I have my rolls of wire next to me and they are 10,000 foot rolls of wire. There's 10 of them, one of each color for the color coding of resistors and such. And they were purchased specifically for the purpose of being able to spool out useful lengths of it, you know, like about six foot or so, put them in an envelope and mail them to people who could use a hand as far as getting started tinkering with analog equipment. I have large quantities of LEDs for the same purpose. I've got large quantities of perf board and I'm in the process of getting, I think the next thing is going to be TL074 op amps because there's a bunch of useful stuff you can do with those. And there's a lot of builds that can usefully uh, work with those things. And more of the already large quantity that I have of a particular kind of pin header that's used for IC sockets, because that's what the wire is for. If I design a synthesizer platform correctly, and if you have the required things to run with, I can set it up so that you can make many, 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 many modules, many cables, many wires, many connections for relatively cheap to next to nothing. I mean, it depends upon literally how many of the things I sent you in the mail for free. There's going to be some of that. I'm going to be sending people stuff in the mail for free when they ask. But I'm also going to be directing people to here's where I got this stuff. If you can afford 60 bucks to get your own massive quantity of, of this or that or thus and so, then go ahead and do it. It will save me the time and effort and an expense of sending people stuff for free. And I can still fill in some of the gaps for folks. Like you could maybe be like, I want to get my own soldering iron. I want to get my own uh, capacitors and ICs, but I don't feel like getting all the colors of wiring. Can you send me a, a sample of each kind of wire and I'll send you like six foot of every color of wire if you're building a little circuit? That's probably enough to run with. You'll probably be able to do the stuff that you need with that. And if you need more, I can tell you exactly where I got it. Like you won't be getting it from where I got it because I got it wholesale from the initial distributor. But you can get all of this stuff from all electronics. This is the same wire that they sell in smaller rolls. So it's like that. It's like that. Now to get back to preponderant, 
let's quickly build it and fool with it because for anybody who has forgotten what this was. Preponderant was this. Here, let's fire up a track. Effects. It's actually so unrecent that uh, we don't have any recent effects anymore, but I'll go and find it. There it is. Now it's going to be unrecent. And we've got this. Preponderant, as I had it, is these three different controls. They are each a, a bandpass filter. And it's kind of similar to my ResiQ. Where you're making a sound out of some uh, component parts. And what I was looking to do is work out some of my code. I can at least start doing this today for the soothe alike quality I had in mind. Because here's the thing in some ways, this is the opposite of soothe, and in some ways, this is the same. And uh, by that, what I mean is highlighting individual resonances. like this, for instance, is the opposite of Sooth. Sooth finds stuff like that, which pops out and nukes it, rather than being a fixed frequency thing that you can find something like that and accentuate it. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm killing your microphones. <laughs> Apologies. You're just gonna have to suffer along with me. Um, Here's the part that could be kind of like Soothe. If I have three different things here, and one of them is the bass sound, and one of them is the mid sound, and one of them is the high sound, the reason I called it preponderant is because, say if I sweep this, I can find a area that's louder, and a guy that was somewhat influential on me, uh, Tim, Tim Gillies, talking about uh, guitar tone managing, talked about distinguishing between areas of power and areas of preponderant energy. Areas of preponderant energy are louder when I sweep. You hear this? That's louder. Areas of power might be places where You can't. You certainly can't hear that because there's not enough bass. But this might be an area of power where it makes the sound stronger in conjunction with everything else, but it's not as loud as the area of preponderant energy. So, preponderant energy up here, area of power. This is the part of the sound that you want, but it's quieter, and you don't just go for the area of preponderant energy, you go for the area of power, accentuate that, so you'd be EQing this down. Well, if I had three different settings, like this, which is doing that horn, and say we liked this here, this is a sort of electric piano area, and those are different levels, I want to use this plugin to auto balance that stuff so that if the output of one is less than the others, rather than simply compressing the loud thing, it balances them on the fly. So they end up hitting the same volume level. That's akin to what Suit does. Sooth does bring up highs and things if they're buried. It does go and find stuff 
that is like not as loud and it is shooting in its particular way for kind of evening everything out. I don't think even evening, evening everything out is useful, but, but, if we construct a sound out of three different frequency bands, and we've got like this one, which is a preponderant energy band, this one, which is kind of a, a duck out, we call it an area of power perhaps, and then this one, which is We can either pick a preponderant energy band like that, that is a lot of energy in the highs, or we can pick one that's more buried. Very small difference there, but that's loud, and that's much quieter. And this is all with very, very high resonance. So if I cut the resonance back, we immediately start sounding like more of a regular sound. Or it can be so wide that everything is balanced. And we'll be constructing the sound around this, around these band passes that can be arbitrarily shallow or, or focused. And they gotta start balancing each other, like what I had before. Let's bounce back just long enough to hear that, and then I'll start coding. Listen to this. Uh, assuming you can hear this, can you hear this? So that's a very bright sound. But if I move a little higher, it's much quieter. I need to code in such a way where it's going to take those three levels and even them so that if I have the highs hitting that area of preponderant energy, it's going to duck the output of the high frequency band a little bit and push bass and mid up relative to it. And then if the highs goes into the area where there's nothing happening, it's going to lift high frequencies and duck bass and mid a little bit rather than just straight up compressing all of them, because the thing is, if that's what's happening, and if I keep it like reasonably well balanced and not too out of control, it means it's not going to function as strictly a multi-band compressor. I wanted to do this balancing thing. I don't want it to just have all of the things compressed at all times. Like if stuff goes quiet, I think this stuff should be allowed to go quiet. And and so I'm looking at balance here rather than just putting a separate compressor in each band. And that's kind of key. And that's also characteristic of what Sooth does relative to literally just being a multi-band compressor. So let's dive in. We'll go away from that for a moment and dive into what our code's doing. And we've got, like everything defined here, we've got our frequencies being defined. We can leave that the way that it is. And we are going to see here's our uh, generating three samples, reconstructing them. That's all this is so far. This is as big as this is. So what we're going to want to do is make a little space here because bass sample, mid sample, and high sample need to have individual level controls for them. I need to not just take those, but also be able to turn them up or down as sees fit. Yeah, it's an earlyish version of Mac OS X. Absolutely. It is a Snow Leopard. I develop on Snow Leopard to make sure that the stuff that I'm making uh, covers the widest range possible. That said, I have an entirely separate machine that is now dedicated to being set up either with Mojave, 
I don't think I'm ever going to touch Catalina. It just seems like too big of a mess. But um, it's either going to be Mojave or I'm going to literally let it go to Big Sur. Whatever is necessary to set up a isolated box with no internet access, running a later version so that I can eventually learn how to port this stuff to newer audio units because this ain't going away. I will not cease to make plugins that run on older machines because older machines retain usefulness for uh, DAWs and synthesis and creativity in general. It is morally wrong to plan obsolescence that stuff and make people get rid of it. It is morally wrong to do that. I'm not going along with it. That said, I may still be able to include the, the newer stuff too. Um, and I am looking, I've got both my Windows and my Linux are already running on Parallels. I do already use Parallels. I do not know whether um, it'll be worthwhile, because one of the things about it is like if I'm running on a real machine that uses Snow Leopard, then I'm not restricted to depending upon Parallels for everything in my life. So uh, we'll see. I doubt, honest, honestly, running on the new M1s and so on, if I was running Parallels in like one of the newer generation stuff that's increasingly coming out, it would probably run all of this faster than on the real laptop that I'm using, which is funny. Uh, it's fine. I'm actively looking into putting... Uh, the Linux and the Windows 7 build that I build on for the VSTs on the newer Mac running Parallels, because right now I'm, I'm running all that stuff on Parallels on this machine. I'm running a really old version of Parallels. And that might not be necessary. I mean, it's, if it runs the same virtual machine as the old version is doing, logically that should be the same. I just have to test it because the thing is, it should be the same, but I installed the Linux environment on a real Linux laptop and it got access to the internet, updated something about itself, and the Linux builds no longer worked. I had to roll it back. So we'll see. I, I have backups of stuff and I am able to find out either directly or indirectly if everything breaks. So it's kind of on me to make sure that everything continues continues to work and uh, keeps up with stuff. So let's, you know, one of the first things I'm going to need to know is I'm going back into here. I might end up using some of these controls that are currently going uh, unused. They're there, but in case I need to tweak something. I might end up using some of these controls to dial in how this balancing act works because I'll have controls that I can get the relevant parameters set up. Fairly often that's how I work rather than like abstractly figuring out exactly how it must go. I'll get it into the ballpark, get some variables that I know are going to be relevant to how I design things, put them on sliders and start experimenting, seeing what the thing does which is, I mean, some people would consider that not as smart as thinking it all out in advance, but I get very fast results. Like if you come, if you look at the Mythbusters guys and you look at Jamie Heineman and you look at Adam Savage, as much as I'm very similar to Jamie Heineman in a bunch of ways, my way of building things is very much like Adam Savage's. Dive in like a madman and start throwing stuff around. Here's an example. I'm going to need to save some variables for this compression-like activity because they're going to need to persist between uh, frames, between buffer frames, and between samples. That stuff is going to need to continue for some extent, so they need to exist as variables here in the header file, the h file, so that I can uh, manipulate them. This is also where you put compression values, and that's kind of what this is like. I may or may not, it may or may not be worth using long doubles. I know that I'm going to do multiplies, so 
anything that I define here, if I define it as like a double precision or the float 64 that the audio unit form format uses, anytime I multiply it with my actual audio samples, which are being kept in long double, it's going to have to promote that up to long double to do the calculation. And that's an extra wasteful step. So it might be worth just doing it as long double from the start. How did I name that stuff? Let, let's go back and look at how I named it. What were the names of the things? Because so I'll have it be consistent. Base, mid, and high. So we'll call it base balance, mid balance, and it's being spelled the same way in hopes that it's easy to keep track of the kind of stuff that's going on. I may or may not need to also have some kind of speed control built in, but we'll leave that alone for now. I've now defined those variables. I now have to initialize them too. That's up here. If I don't, they could be anything and there could be messy problems. Now my question is, do I want that to be, let's make them all be one. You know why? Because if it's like a compression thing or an amplification thing, multiplying by one would be unity gain. So I can build in something. I don't even need to check for if it works. All I need to do is, this is all the setup here. Here's a C-ism. Times equal is the same thing as going base sample equals base sample times base balance. So it's this little abbreviation thing that I've come to enjoy. I use that pretty often for stuff. Yep. Now, if I compile this and run this, it'll run exactly the same as before, because I'm not changing base sample, mid sample, or a high sample in any way. But that's the part that I need to immediately do something about. So what I'm going to do is maybe set up some if statements and maybe set up some sanity checks. And by that, I mean, <laughs> bunch of that. Actually, no. Let me dial that back because I can do it better. Um, I also want a sanity check for the other extreme. So let's call it uh, the largest I can boost. This is de this is determining um, how much I can attenuate and how much I can boost. I may not want to attenuate very much. Let's change this again. I'll tell you why. This is this is going to uh, what I like to call word length shift gain territory in that it's it's pegging it at minimum volume being, I think, something like 12 dB down. Is it? Uh, 
0 0.5 is 6 dB down, so 0 0.25 would be 12 dB down. Again, that is same thing as word length shift gain, which is a lossless process. So we can set that up like that, where these do have sanity checks built in, which are also lossless multiplications. And the counterbalance of that would be a multiplication of 4, 2 or 4. So that would be 12 dB up. If I convert this over to all of the different ones, little copy-paste fess here, and then high balance. So I may have better typing. These do the same things. You can space them out a little bit so you can see them better. And this is now something by which, if I'm changing this base balance and mid balance and high balance around, they can't go too crazy. We're still adjusting the levels of everything. Now, how would we set this? Another set of if statements, most likely. What we're going to do is we can either move these things gradually or try to move them abruptly. And by gradually, I mean they can creep upwards or downwards relative to whether they're louder or not. Gradually is good. Abruptly means you're going to get uh, aliasing. But we could do that on purpose just to see what it's like. Let's see, what do we got? Let's go back over to the other one. We are now returning to this so that we can set up something that would be useful. And let's use parameter 4. Some of these things might stay in the final product if they wind up really useful. Quickness ain't necessarily one of them, but we'll see. We'll save that. And then I got to go and make something happen using the same parameter four. It goes from zero to one. So I'll probably, well, I may or may not be multiplying it by anything. And we'll tuck it down here for now. My hands are in a slightly awkward position from being in the YouTubing, so that is why I'm copy-pasting that rather than just trying to type it. So now we're going to have a number called amount that is parameter 4, that is 0 to 1. So I can set some stuff up where I start comparing, like, is... The is the loudness of this quieter than the loudness of that? And that's what I would be using as far as adjusting these volume levels and things. So amount is the amount that I would adjust it by. Let's scale it down, because remember, we're doing all of these things up, upwards of 44,000 times per second. So very small amounts are going to turn into very big results very quick. Not only that, the um, every waveform is liable to be interfering with other, every other waveform. So these things are going to be fluctuating really rapidly, like at audio frequency rates. And that's not necessarily helpful. On the other hand, since they're fluctuating so fast, I can kind of use that to smooth it out simply by having it change very, very small amounts. So let's dial this back even more. Let's assume that our max is going to be probably way less than this. I'm, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to see whether I can set it up to alias heavily so we can hear what that sounds like. It should be a, a noisy mess if I've done this properly, because you need to slow it down in order to have a useful behavior. So, we've now got a mount. I 
I learned recently that if I do fabs or you know absolute value of a thing, then it uh, doesn't handle things properly in Catalina. So I have to bear that in mind with this calculation, but it shouldn't matter because I'll be using fabs on pretty much everything. I could also just set up a sort of running tally of each one though. And I'm trying to decide right now whether to do that, whether to try to do it directly, which is in some ways opposite of what I really want, or whether I try to do it by the intermediate quality. Let's set up the intermediate quality. I think a lot of this is falling into a certain characteristic. I'm naming this something. So what I'm going to be doing is we have this vibration. It's a audio frequency. And we're busting things into three separate waveforms, each of which are their own amplitude and each of which are their own frequency. Like the high frequency one, it's never going to have more than very momentary little flicks in any given direction. Since I'm trying to keep track of sort of the, you know, like a VU meter, I'm trying to keep a general sense of how loud the thing is. That's what I'm looking for. So I'm going to be tracking something and then as it decays and the, the thing that I'm tracking I'm going to be using the absolute value of that and if it's greater than the thing uh, the chase factor is going to go up to a higher value and then it's going to fall away much more gradually maybe it'll fall away with the same quickness control that I've got so I'm looking for a word that describes how you peg the VU meter up and it takes some time for it to fall back. Um, meter isn't necessarily the right word for this. Balance is the right word for the other thing I was doing, but meter is not necessarily the right word for this. Let's call it track. Not because this is a multi-track recorder, but because I'm trying to track the general loudness of these things. And it will decay, but it won't decay in, I think I'm going to have it decaying in a additive type of way rather than a multiplicative type of way, because this is not being used directly on anything. This is only being used to compare relative loudnesses of things. So, and I'm going to want to do it in such a way where it is easily calculated. So doing this, we are tracking how loud the thing is. And the result is always going to be trying to stay the same as the loudest noise that was made recently or, or just made, but then it falls off more gradually but it'll do so in a sort of arithmetical way rather than a uh, logarithmic way. Before I explain that, let's initialize this value as well. And then I'll do my, uh, if it lets me, This is marginally faster for me to do than typing it when by reaching over awkwardly to the keyboard. If I was just sitting in my coding chair, it would be different. Um, now we have those. We have those. So now we're going to use them. is less than <laughs> I 
There. Now that puts it up to the correct level. So we'll do that three times for Probably easier to just type those. Be sure to get everyone. And get this as well. We're not quite done because it's not falling off yet, but we're going to do that. How do I deal with the arrays while I'm coding? I already am. Uh, by quad C, B, and A are arrays. If, if you have further questions on that, then by all means elucidate. Let's see now. Uh, I'll have to do a bounds check for this. What was our control here? Let's set it up with the mount, right? Yeah, the mount. That will make it drop away again. So now we've got a thing which is trying to follow the amplitude of the signal, which has been bridge rectified. Fabs means it's only positive. And so it's going to fall back with every spike of the output. How much? Well, a minus equal. So rather than having it falling away logarithmically by going divided by two or something, it's minus by two. So it it's going to fall away linearly. That's what I'm after for this one. That's not always what you want, but I have actually, I think that that's that used in uh, the pressure algorithm. Oh, uh, pray in hands. Uh, what is the, I don't know how that has to do with arrays, so you can fill me in on that if needed. So these are now falling away by however much amount is, which is going to be really strikingly fast, but that's fine for the time being. It's one of the things we're doing. So now we have base track, mid track, and high track. What we're going to do to make it chase various things is we're going to, every time we check whether something is larger or smaller than something else, we're going to adjust both of the things. Oh, okay, so high five, fair enough. We're going to go, is base track bigger than mid track? If base track is bigger than mid track, base track gets littler mid-track gets larger, or, I'm sorry, base, no, base track. If base track is l larger than mid-track, base balance gets smaller, mid-balance gets bigger. And it's going to do that in a loop around every pair of uh, balances that can be used. So that's going to be a little fussy, but we can do it. We're going to need to use brackets because we're going to do more than one control. It's larger than... And there's going to be an else because if it's not, we do the opposite. Larger than...
We're going to expand these outwards as we as needed. So that now does nothing, but it compares each one with each other one, one way or another. Like if base track is larger than mid track, we got this. Otherwise, mid track is larger than base track, we got that. And it, that is the case for all the different varying things that we do. Oh, interesting. It made it go away. That's really not what I had in mind, so... Instead, let's start filling in some of this stuff by putting some carriage returns in so we have space to work. And then we're going to start doing this. I think I can put them on one line. So if base track is larger than base balance, minus equals amount and mid balance plus equals amount else copy there is up over to here else base balance plus equals amount and mid balance minus equals amount if I do that with each of these things, it will adjust all of the things to try to make them be comparable. Or rather, base balance, mid balance, and high balance, it's not feeding back, so it's just going to continue to adjust them until they reach their maximums. Unless, well, it might need to feed back. I, we'll find out, we'll find out. We're going to explore what happens here. So with this one, mid track larger than high, then mid needs to go down, high needs to go up. I do know how I can make it uh, feed this back. It might be worth doing immediately, but not so immediately that I can't do this bit. So mid track larger than high means mid needs to come down, high needs to come up. If mid track not larger than high, then mid needs to go up, high needs to come down. And then lastly, if high larger than base, then high needs to come down, base needs to go up, or the opposite is true, so high needs to go up, and base needs to come down. I think at this point I can put in spaces here without making it delete itself. So I put a space in and the brackets went away because they were around nothing. There we go. This could be squished into a smaller space, but I don't think I need to. Um, having done this, this is now adjusting things. Now balance... All of this is fitting together in such a way that if we do that, and then put this here, these balances are being kept over from the previous time. So anytime we update them is fine. We're going to adjust the samples relative to what the balances are saying, and only then are we going to check whether they're larger than each other? That means that we have a degree of feedback. And this should now be a working thing. Let's build it and find out what it does. I 
I may need to accentuate it somewhat to make it more obvious as to what's happening. Let's go to the same thing we were listening to before. And set quickness to something, probably too much. And these are now varying among each other. Now we have a bass, a mid, and a high. Resonance is extremely high. Quicknesses of zero means nothing is happening at all. Quickness of very high means they're fiddling around insanely fast. Now what should be happening is this. We should have comparable loudness to these multiple bands. Like if this is loud, it should quieten itself. And that should loudenate itself. That was loud. And it should balance itself. We have no convenient way with the generic audio units to show a display, but if there were displays, it would be showing you like what the amplitudes are. It's interesting to me that I'm using such a high value of quickness. And if I set the bass to do something like that, super bright. If I set it to super bright, it should be amplifying that. And I think it is. I kind of hear it. This is not going to work, however. Too high of a setting is excessive. So it should be turning up or down these frequencies based on how loud they wind up to be. And quickness is how fast it's doing it. If I make the quickness be really, really fast, it's getting grungy because it's just modulating everything incredibly quickly. But it does seem to be doing the thing. And remember, I've got this at very high resonance. If I back it off, we've got super high quickness again. I'm surprised at how, I thought I was gonna to have to divide quickness a lot more. This, this is proving effective in a surprising way. I thought I was gonna to have to pull it way back. Although it, I think it's kind of modulating still rather quickly. Zero, it doesn't move at all. And then that's super bright. Let's increase the quickness back up again. It's just not responding fast enough to that. thump there. Bypasses this. And 
fooling with the controls to uh, see how it's reacting. Like again, if I increase quickness, it's going to start modulating everything really fast. And if I have low resonance, it's going to blend everything really hard. A little less resonance and we start hearing interesting things happen. We got our mids there. Now one of the things that we could do is do a sort of Fletcher Munson compensation where loud stuff responds more. That said, I'm not sure if I want that because one of the soothe things is this tendency of rebalancing stuff so that it heightens the highs more. And I'm not using all the like soothe stuff for this, but some aspects of it might prove useful. So one of the things I'm going to do here is Let's make it go crazy. Want to hear what it sounds like when it breaks and goes completely bonkers? Let's have some fun. We've got these sanity checks in in such a way that they can't cut completely. But if we mess with that, we can allow the cuts and boosts to become enormous. Yeah, uh, Red is looking forward to this. There. Now we effectively don't have sanity checks any longer. Like, uh, we could comment that out completely, but it might just go splat. However, uh, or shall we? Okay, let's comment this out completely. Now it no longer has sanity check. That said, having done that, I might as well put it back to what I had. We're not necessarily going to keep that, mind you, but... There, no sanity check. Let's see what madness we can produce. The uh, no amount actually was fairly decent, but I think I'm going to give it another decimal point here. Because um, the really high settings were clearly all messed up. It might not need to be as tiny as I thought, but I think it needs to be more than... I'm also a little concerned about dragons not being a good example here because it's too well balanced. You might want to have stuff which has more tonal imbalances to it because that's part of what this does is it's messing things around. Okay, let's, let's get loud. There is an error. Let's see what we can do to fix that. What shall we do? Balance has got too high. Therefore, let's scale them all back if we need. Uh, balance is being scaled by amount. If and it's always some positive thing, and it's getting made to be a high number. Therefore, we can just add these together.
what would be a good stupidly high number? Uh, let's call it 16. They should be able to get small, but um, if anything gets that loud, or we could... Huh. Let's say nobody gets to be too insanely loud. Um, six. So if all of them are two, meaning all of them are six dB boost, then too far. And what do we do then? We go. We're scaling them all down by the same thing we were using before. There we go. That will stop it from going crazy loud while still retaining the behavior that we want. In fact, it'll make the quiet ones go even quieter. And now what we've got is... Although some of these balances can now be negative. Well, we'll find out whether this does terrible things by trying it. Let's skip ahead to the same thing as before. Fairly often I go for like always the same thing. Okay, what happened? Did I forget to copy it over? No, I did copy it over. Oh. Let's try something. I think if they go wildly negative, See what I'm doing? This is temporary stuff because it's supposed to be handled differently. But for now, we're trying to make the crazy behavior uh, behave itself just enough that it doesn't flip out completely. So if these absolute values are too high, I'm tempted to include some of the sanity checks or indeed to go with the... because. I know what's happening is like it's making some of this stuff go down to less than zero. And if it goes down to less than zero, it just continues to escalate. So some of the insanely loud stuff might be multiplied rather than by two for 60 B boost or like 0 0.25. It's getting multiplied by negative 200 or something. It's one of the things that can happen with a plugin is that it goes crazy when it starts doing something and you were expecting it always to be above zero but it's going minus amount, and the farther it goes, the more it goes kablooey. So we're going to steal some of these things just to use for this purpose and delete it later once we're done. And here's one, a sanity check. So if it makes stuff absolutely silent and stuff remains silent, that should be enough. In fact, that I won't need this fabs anymore, so let's not have it. The parentheses don't actually hurt, so I might as well leave those. I don't need to delete them because the whole thing is going away anyway. Here we go, back into this. My guess is it's not going to blow up with insane volume this time. I could be wrong. Well, we're about to find out. 
And it is a shitty speaker you're hearing it on, but the reason it sounded so bad was because it was wildly distorted. If you watch the, the playback, you saw that the meter was saying like plus 30 dB or more. Now what have we got? Uh -oh. We got trouble. Honestly, I'm tempted to just throw this all out and go back to the sanity checks that worked, shall we? I wanted to do this very interestingly and excitingly, but I think it has just absolutely failed. Screw this. We're not going to do that. We're going to go back to the sanity checks. We're just going to increase them somewhat. This worked. So what we're going to do is... What I tried before, well, no, let's not multiply that by so much. Let's, let's duck it farther. We'll make it possible to duck it farther and we'll boost by less. And see what we get. Yeah, this, this whole removing the sanity check completely was not wise. It did not amount, I didn't learn anything. All it was doing was blowing up, but not in a useful or helpful way. It probably meant that the values got super high. These values might end up being our maximum amount of sort of compression-like behavior, even if it's not being implemented as compression exactly. Now what do we got? High quickness. Cut the resonance. Seems to be kind of doing the thing. It's hard to tell how well you can hear this. I don't know when I'm going to be able to get proper feedback through this whole system so that you can hear it. It gets complicated. But on the whole, if we find area, like let's cut quickness back again. When we do this, it shouldn't be changing anymore. be able to say I just this down to here and this up to here and when I fool with this mid I can go to an area where that's louder and this is quieter but if I turn quickness back on, it's making the louder area go away again. You're finding the area, but it's being compensated for on the fly. And then quieter part, it's getting amplified up again. This is kind of what I was after. And the reason this is a soothe alike, in the sense, not alike at all, but in the reason that this is the kind of thing I would do with that type of control, is it's going to try to make the high frequency band have the same amplitude as the low frequency band regardless of what's in it. So like if I have this node here, I get a certain amount of lows. 
if it's down to where it is a subsonic thump, it's going to amplify that up until you can hear it. So now we've got a sort of huge swamp in there. And if I shallow out the resonance, you start getting them interfering with each other and you get more boost. But it's still doing that thing where it's balancing everything on the fly. And you can see in the controls here. It's going to balance this stuff out. Where it's bringing out its highs more. can overlap or not. I'm going to need to put an output level control on here, obviously. But the soothe style behavior, actually maybe I don't. I'm wondering whether I can pad everything relative to how much what the, the resonance is set at. Like this made it become much quieter. Let's dive in and fool with that a little bit. So I've got a resonance control. It's this. It's by quad A1. It is from 0 0.1 to 10. So if I just, I don't think that's going to change, not in the course of doing stuff. It's being used as a temporary thing. So if I did, just quickly did this, times, see it says these are all the same. This is our resonance setting. It's going from 0 0.1 which is massive attenuation to essentially 10.1, which is a pretty substantial amplification. If I multiply the output by that, it means it'll be pulled way back for these broad resonance settings that are getting us heavily distorted, and it'll start amplifying like crazy when I have the narrow resonance settings that are dropping back in level. Let's see what we get. Or we could even define another thing and just include it. But for now, let's just find out what we get. So we'll put that here. And then since that's not changing, since that is just the, the default for, for what we've got, it'll follow our control, but we're not altering it in the loop here. Add that one thing, and it's doing some kind of volume compensation. How much, though? The volume compensation we're getting, and again, back to the same thing. I probably should dive into some other stuff, though, that's weirder so that I can test this more effectively. And I forgot to, no, I didn't forget to. I went to the right one. Let's put this normal. That sounds good. I like that. Very resonant. Very unresonant. I like that. That's working. I think that's working pretty good. Check it out. At the lowest resonance, 
we're still getting sounds, but it's so shallow that it's like ain't nothing happening. We're also not seeing much difference in these quickness aspects. And as we start applying it, I might be able to do this with this smaller range of adjustment on this guy. It is going a bit loud though. Let's make it loud and then fool with it. setting that's being attenuated maybe more than it needs to be seeing as these are overlapping quick change yep making a plugin so here's what I'm thinking we're using this right That's for compensation, not compression. Equals. No, did that wrong. There, now if we use this, it we could just have it be by quad A, but instead it is the square root. That means it's going to, if it's a high number, it's going to multiply that less. And if it's a tiny number like 0 0.1, it's going to be like, what did you have to multiply by itself to get to 0 0.1? That means it's going to pad less on the smaller settings. So we replace this with this. And we've just adjusted our volume compensation to some extent. We'll see what that gets us. This is falling into shape. I think this is going to end up being workable. I'm still not quite sure what some of the, uh, the quickness stuff has to do, but that's one of the reasons I'm trying to exaggerate it is so that I can hear what that's doing. Now that was supposed to be really loud and weird. We have relatively comparable volume. Not bad, okay. We have absolutely comparable volume. Cool. When we hit bypass, we can go as, as uh, resonant as we want. And it's just ducking this stuff. Yeah. We can get loud with this though. But then these are almost overlapping, so. This is the area where we would want it to be distorted and wrong, is all the same level. Normally we'd be doing it like this, bass, mid, and high. And then if we do the resonance that way, it's tracking really well. This is good, this is coming together. And our range is higher than we're gonna want. We don't need to have it be this narrowly defined. But if we do, that's a really resonant area. That's supersonic, there's almost nothing, no content there. It's a subsonic pump. And it is, in fact, going in search of all that stuff. Quickness being slower 
would smooth this out, quickness being faster, will make it twitchier. trying to do here is get it so that it's modulating really fast in a way that I can hear how fast it's modulating so I can get a sense of what quickness is supposed to be. I feel like I don't want quickness to be a final control. It doesn't feel like it's doing anything useful. I want it to be like behind the curtain managing stuff. There should be an optimal setting for this that might be relative to uh, sample rate. I might need to adjust it for that, but that there's going to be a setting that makes this stuff, and remember quickness is modulating all the parts of this algorithm at once. Faster means it switches and does stuff more abruptly. Slower means less aliasing. So we want slower that can still handle stuff I don't feel it needs to suddenly and abruptly react all the time. Let's run this again, see what we got. Very resonant. It's very quick. Let's do the opposite, very unquick. Highs back up again. Let's give it a little more. I'm trying to go back and forth between uh, loud bits and very quiet bits. Oh, interesting. It made it duck away really hard. What's going on with that there? Probably shouldn't let it go this high. Lighting Gale, are you the person that? Does I plug to? Because if so, I have followed some of your stuff. I didn't understand it, but I went and looked at it and thought you were very... In fact, I may be supporting you on Patreon. I'm not sure. I forget. Somebody like that. I jumped on their Patreon and I was like, yes, keep doing this thing. Uh, let's dive back into this. I was in the middle of working on something. So yeah, we're looking for quickness. To do useful things. We cut it way back. Oh, fair enough. I feel those loud highs, I feel I hear them wavering a little bit. If I can dial quickness back to the point where it's not wavering so aggressively, I think I'll be satisfied with where it's at. Ah, oh, yes, lots of loudness. Here's 
a little more wavery here. Boy, we get a lot of high spoofs going on. And that is because this filtering is going up to Nyquist here. It's actually very different from what we had originally. Remember how I was talking about areas of preponderant energy versus areas of power? This is what this is about. Like in the original one, we had an area around here that was really loud. Whereas, move up to here and it became very quiet. But now, we can move up to there. And I mean, if you like incredibly bright highs, it's very powerful. This is an area of power in the ride symbol. <laughs> oh, Ray. Yeah, that's what Patreon is for, or that's also what open source is for. People can go and make interfaces all they want, but they have to keep up. Good luck keeping up with me. I hear it wavering. find a setting on quickness that wavers less. That feels good. So the normal setup is less resonance, plain and simple. So now I get a funky thing which is balancing these three bands to make them equal in volume level. It's pulling a lot of kick out of the lows, so much so that it's making the speaker fart and it's pulling a lot of brightness out of the highs. Or we can choose a... I think a lot of this is I just want all of these to be broader resonance. So my whole control needs to be dialed back a little bit. That's a higher voicing, but without as much of the crazy high frequencies in there, and with less of the super low bass. Or we can dial in more of that kick again. Even wider separation. You could use this on things like symbols or something. Full resonance. I 
I just thought of something that might be good. This could be a power factor. That'll give me plenty of variation in the low range. And then if you push it all the way to the extreme, then it goes crazy that way. In fact, I could even tighten, let's, let's get pretty silly. We're gonna have even more resonance on tap rather than less, but we've now got all this stuff set up to sort of compensate for it. And let's see, we got this going on. Our maximum cut is pretty small. Let's divide it in half. Our maximum boost is probably fine. That said, Do we think it's worth restricting the maximum boost for some of these things? Like, do we think that it is useful to have the crazy highs be able to get cranked up that much? Or maybe not so much as all that. What kind of, what kind of values have we got floating around here? We got 0 0.5, 0 to 0 0.5 effectively for these. That's our uh, frequencies. Mm. Yeah, maybe I'm on the wrong track there. I was trying to think about like whether I could make some of these sanity checks be scaled up or down relative to where the control was set. But that's not necessarily uh, what we're going to want to do. We've got that all set up. In fact, I think I can consolidate this a bit. This is just purely visual. I want to rearrange it so that it looks like this. I take up a little less space on the screen. And I'll be able to understand it a little easier. I mean, I understand it, but uh, when I come back and look at it again. So there's our sanity checks. I wouldn't need these brackets except for there's two things being changed each time. I'm still kind of, it's not really a sooth clone, it's something else, it's preponderant. Preponderant is not the same as sooth, it's just got some similar characteristics and one of them yeah, yeah, literally as in mutation on the concepts of Oak Sound Sooth. By that, it produces resonances rather than removes them. But it balances the resonances much like Sooth would be balancing stuff. Rather than taking away areas of just energy, you're specifying the, ener the areas of resonance and then it's going to balance those. So if the result of some area of resonance where you're dialing in on a sound is getting weak volume, it will pump that up. It will balance that relative to the other stuff. So that's the mutation. The reason that it is anything like Soothe is twofold. One, 
that it is automatically shifting the balance between things. I am also curious as to one other idea. I've been setting this up. Wasn't that 0 0.78? I'll, I'll worry about that later. But we've got our input sample. Watch what I do here. Uh, I'm going to take a moment and check here. Base balance. Did I have these as long doubles? Yes, I did. Okay, so I'm going to want this also to be a long double. Watch what I do here. I did this earlier, but we're going to remove that first indication of this and change it to something else because we are now doing equals... times we are now scaling how fast it changes by how loud it is here's why that matters in fact I might need to fiddle with this make it be more intense now that I've done that, because now everything is going to move a lot slower. This is not dissimilar to what I'm doing on Curve. It's only changing the relative balances if sound is happening. So if you make a bunch of sudden sounds, it'll be able to co compensate. And then if it goes silent, it doesn't start changing the sounds based on nothing being there. Hear what I'm saying? Like right now, if this went to total silence in digital black, it would be trying to set those levels based on nothing. And that's no good. So also what I'm wondering is uh, whether there should be maybe a bit of a threshold. And by that, what I mean is um, this preset amount times fab sample I could have the whole thing minus something and then if it was less than zero make it be equal to zero and that would mean that it would only start adjusting once you had a certain amount of sound going on because there's not necessarily that much usefulness to doing a bunch of wild changes based on like the reverb tail so there is an idea that said, um, or, or rather than do the fabs, I could do this. Negative number times a negative number equals a positive number. So that did the same thing, but now all the small values get tiny. increasingly tiny the farther they go. So now we've got something where I'm going to need to scale uh, amount way up to have anything happen. Let's see what we got. We've just done this. Let's see what it made. Oh, present amount. I didn't update that. Let's fix that. Now it'll be fine. Now remember, there were several changes. I increased the resonance. I did this whole thing with preset amount. So stuff can get away from you if you run too wildly in these directions. I'm comfortable doing it because I've been doing this for many, 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 many years. But if you were doing the same thing, you might want to do stuff a little bit more one at a time. You have to be very comfortable at heavily intuitive processing to be able to do it with that many factors changing at once, and it will sometimes lose me.
Very resonant. We certainly have a lot of extra volume, but that's partly the intensity of the resonance here. Ah, I had it set up to where quickness was high enough that it was modulating. Let's get very resonant. This is reacting very quickly. You can hear it kind of grunging. And then we take the quickness way down it starts cleaning up. So this is what I was looking for. And this kind of gnarly sound is too much amount. But I can fix that. This is many, many times what I had before even with the compensation. Though I feel it's gotten a lot louder. Like, well, maybe not as much as I thought. This is bypass. Heavy, heavy resonance. Less resonance. Again, heavy, heavy resonance here more than I had before. It's just like resonant filters clanging away like mad. And the gains keep getting pushed up. I think I might want to do something about that. Yeah, this was never meant to be a compressor, so I have a concern. These should all add up to be about one. So far, all of this is hanging in. I can set preset amount appropriately. These latest changes are not unreasonable, but, and I'm running a little over time, I'm going to have to get off at some point. Um, but this was never meant to be a compressor. It was never meant to have bass balance, mid balance, and high balance all end up as massive boosts, even if, even if you were in a very uh, resonant zone. So what I'm gonna think about here is I wonder if maybe it's the scaling of these things. Whether I have an issue with it being too large, because like now what I'm thinking about is if I multiplied them all by each other, what would I get? Like if this is times 4, and this is times 0 0.25, which is divided by 4, and I multiply them by each other, I get 1. And if the middle one was 1, and I multiply by that, it would get 1. So, let 
Let us do one further thing and see what happens. No, not if, define something. Multiplies are safe to multiply stuff by two, so I don't have to worry about dividing by zeros. Equals. So, overall balance. is the result of all of those things. Let's just quickly implement this and see what we got. That should be scaling everything. Mind you, if I was constantly multiplying that by everything else, it might act kind of like a compressor, which I wouldn't be wanting. So we're kind of tracking everything combined. It should all end up being about one. Like if they were all one, then one times one times one equals obviously one, and then everything gets multiplied by one. So if everything was neutral, nothing would happen here. Let's see what we got. And I might just want to turn that to a long double just for simplicity of the uh, compiler not having to promote it to a new value because it'll work out the same in the long run. Now, what have we got? Same conditions. Do we end up boosting like mad? Signs point to no. <laughs> okay. Yikes. Wow. <laughs> Didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> Something went terribly, terribly wrong. I wonder what it was. Hmm. Yeah. That was surprising. That was a big noise. Well, we know not to go any farther into that. What have we got? How about overall balance only gets to be an attenuation? Because I was getting an amplification and that's what I'm trying to do is dial it back. So overall balance never gets to be a large number. Let's try using some fancier math. Um, I believe that will overload and give me, even in long double, either a tiny, tiny number or one. Let's see whether it worked. Oh, it was not declared in this scope. It didn't work. So never mind that then. You have that in some programming languages, apparently not in C. I'll do it with the if statement. Heck with it, I'll do it live. There, we cap it. You can't amplify anymore. You can only attenuate. Let's see what we got. Uh, 
And with this, I might be needing to uh, log off. I'm running over, my voice is kind of shot. Uh, but I think we've made some darn good progress. Let's see how much. Will you get crazy loud again? Let's find out. Kind of, kind of loud, but... But we have very high resonance going on. Here, this is teaching me something. That rumbliness is too much quickness, like this. Let's go to a nice control setting. the boostiness goes away. It's, that's going to need some working on. Because I suspect what's going to happen is as I adjust this, it will creep up. And that's not wanted behavior. Let's manipulate it. And low resonance is now louder. At low resonance, you can't really hear what it's doing. And then if I hit bypass, it goes back. So something's up there. So quickness seems kind of funny here. One thing about it, resonance is definitely way higher than I need. We don't need it to be this exaggerated. Yeah, when I hit bypass, the levels go right down again. Something's got a drifting out of control behavior in there. Let's make one little comfort adjustment before logging off for the day. Instead of 20 resonance, let's go to a max of about 8 and power of 2, so we still have a nice uh, arrangement and if this number was like 0 0.7 something or whatever, it would be minimum of Butterworth filter. Making this be very small numbers means insanely shallow resonance and letting through almost all the content. I wonder whether that's at the heart of what's going on here. whether volume compensation needs to be taken down by a factor of about three. I mean, it was working pretty well, though. Mm. 
Yeah, and maybe we're going to do it just with this uh, resonance parameter. That's going to stay in the in the plugin. Scaling down preset amount again. I think it's working having the amount be scaled by power input sample 2. That is going to slow its reaction when nothing's happening, and it seemed like that was happening. These balances, or one tracking seems to be... Actually, no, that should start at like closer to zero. I'm no longer sure I want to do it this way. Let's leave a little more effective, but not have it be the power, because that makes the peaks way too effective at manipulating stuff. This is supposed to stop it from getting too loud. Base sample times these balances. If all of the resonances are widened out until everything is at full crank, this is three times the volume. So if we do this, because remember, 2 times the volume is 60 dB boost. If we were getting a little over 60 dB boost, as a general rule, that might be it. Let's have a last glance, and then I'm going to bid you good day for the day. It's getting about time I can talk to the Chapman stick people. And then there's also other stuff I gotta do. Minimum resonance. Quickness to bring everything up. Let's Start this over. Because that's the thing, if quickness is getting things grungy, it's also bringing it closer to its, its fundamental state. Now if I do bypass here, Feels like it's resetting some of those parameters, but there isn't necessarily that much I can do about it. I do have to have reset controls. Hyper resonant again. Oh, that's funky. That grindy noise that I can just barely hear will probably help me set quickness appropriately. And sure enough, it needs to be a very small volume, a uh, very small setting. Crunchiness.
Here's an all mid rangey one. Here's that one that brings out the kick. Isolate the kick. Bring a little dry wet. Area of power in the high frequencies. Nice tone in the horn. And I think we're starting to get something. This can be used either with a less aggressive resonance or just make it go crazy bonkers. Combine it with some dry. necessarily great but uh, it's often useful to be able to get bad sounds and stuff as well bypass we don't have crazy high resonance but this is still letting us get some pretty severe resonance Feels like something a bit weird is up here. Yeah, it feels like something is weird here. On the other hand, changing to bypass is not throwing it so far off. It seems to be settling down with quietness, so that's good. You'll hear it struggling. It's supposed to sound like this. Feels like this part should be able to be louder. Sure, the divide by three thing is is helping me. Let's quickly take that out, and then on that note, we might not have had uh, entire rousing success. There's probably still more work to do. I could get back into this maybe uh, next week. I gotta give it a rest for now though.
let's put our chat window back. Alrighty. So yeah, this has been interesting. And even though the last bits of it led in a weird direction, I think there is some promise there that is preponderant. Preponderant is a uh, upcoming plugin. And when I sort it out to the extent that it does the stuff that I want it to do, you shall be seeing it. And it is for doing that. It's for bringing out sort of little resonant zones and balancing them. And that's the purpose of that exercise. On that note, I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.